Welcome to The Response, a show about how communities respond to disasters. This week, we're bringing you the first installment of a new sporadic series that we're calling Disaster Dispatches. Each dispatch will feature a short conversation with people within or near the disaster zones who are able to provide insight into how things look on the ground and, in many cases, share firsthand accounts of the response. First up, we have Mina Polyneopin joining us once again. This time to talk about the recent 5.6 magnitude earthquake that struck the city of Cianjur in the West Java region of Indonesia on November 21st. While our full-length interview with Mina was released last week, it had actually been recorded two weeks earlier on Friday the 18th, three days before the earthquake. Since that time, Mina has traveled back to Indonesia and is now joining us from the city of Jakarta. Also, just one more thing to note. We recorded this dispatch last Friday, December the 5th. Over the weekend, in the same region, there was another earthquake and a volcanic eruption. We were unable to schedule a third call with Mina, so there will be no reference to those other events during the following interview. Hi, Mina. Nice to have you on. Yeah. Can you start by sharing a brief description of Cianjur and the region that was most impacted by the earthquake? Yeah, so Cianjur is in West Java, um, the main island where Jakarta is in Indonesia. It was a 5.6 magnitude earthquake that struck on November 21st, uh, 2022. So um, just uh, you know, less than two weeks ago. And the immediate aftermath of the earthquake was over 83,000 houses were damaged, over 300 people perished. Most of these were children in, in after-school programs. Uh, over 100,000 people were displaced and 169 villages were affected. Um, so the, the impacts of the earthquake were incredibly dramatic and um, very uh, shocking. And a lot of that has to do with the quality of the housing and the buildings in the area. Um, it, it's, it's a lower income area where there are villages, it's not. Um, a primary city like Jakarta or Bandung, where it's between these two um, metro centers. Um, and yeah, it was just um, heartbreaking how, um, how much uh, devastation there was. Yeah, I understand that there were, you know, beyond the kind of uh, damage to homes and to lives, that there was also, a, the earthquake caused a number of um, landslides across the region, mm -hmm. burying roads and preventing access to the affected areas, you know, mm -hmm. except for those on motorbikes and, and or on foot, and that that has led to a, a lot of complications or initially was led to a lot of complications around emergency services, first responders, and, you know, there was a number of health impacts that happened as a result of, of lack of access in the region. Um, I'm wondering, is, was this earthquake a rare occurrence for this area, or are earthquakes more of a common natural hazard in the region? Yes, it is. It's a common occurrence in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is in the Pacific Ring of Fire, so very prone to volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and the after effects of earthquakes can be tsunamis. Um, as we saw in the Great Pacific Tsunami that um, had a tremendous impact in Indonesia um, over a decade ago. Uh, and in, in cases where the earthquake is affecting um, land, landslides become a big, a big issue. And so um, there were, Indonesia's had more than 150 earthquakes with a greater than seven magnitude between uh, 1901 and 2019. So um, it's significantly impacted by that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this, um, this issue that happens in the aftermath of earthquakes. And we experience this 
um, in Sulawesi after the um, tsunami, the earthquake that caused a tsunami in the Sulawesi area of Indonesia. And this was um, a few years ago. And the reality was government um, agencies, uh, first responders like Red Cross and Mercy Corps were not able to access the area um, because of the um, uh, the the, the road, the, the affected roads and um, the landslides that had happened. It made it inaccessible. And what was incredible there is how quickly we uh, brought up that location, Sulawesi, on our mobile app um, for Neighbors Helping Neighbors, Atmago, and the way in which it helped um, first responders see into what the needs were and also for people to help one another. We have a story of a user, Imelda from Sulawesi, who um, her apartment building, days after the earthquake, didn't have uh, water. And she didn't know where to find water. There was no information on this. She looked on Facebook, looked on Twitter, and couldn't find an, any way to get water for her family. And she looked on Atmago and found out about a location near her that had water supply. And it's this kind of um, uh, interweaving of the sort of peer-to-peer -peer support uh, in um, disaster-affected areas that's so, um, so powerful. Um, it's your neighbors are your next responders. They're the ones that are there before um, agencies can arrive to support and um, and they're the ones that are going to be there once the agencies leave um, to rebuild to provide psychosocial support another story of you know sort of like these there are these there, there's the you know the time when these responding agencies are there maybe they come a few days after they're there for um, a few weeks or a month, and uh, we have another story from Lombok that was affected by an earthquake. It's another island in Indonesia where a woman um, said that she had so mu had so much uh, post traumatic stress disorder from the earthquake that she wasn't able to leave her house, and it was um, the posts on Atmago from her neighbors about Lombok Rises and um, bringing people together to say, we can rise from this again. And that that's what motivated her to, um, to, to leave her house and to, um, to overcome that um, fear. And so it's that, it, it's the entire road or the entire cycle. So after that, what, we saw, what we've seen in so many of these places is how people are organizing um, activities and events um, to build community and to prevent the next disaster. Planting mangrove trees, which happened um, in, um, in Lombok, and uh, clearing up garbage and organizing, um, uh, organizing rescue um, teams. Yeah, so. I mean, so it really does feel like Atmago was built for kind of these these disasters like what just happened in, in Chianjur. I'm, I'm wondering if you can just kind of talk a little bit about kind of what that kind of immediate use of Atmago was like following, following the earthquake uh, you know, 12 days ago. Yeah, so uh, we are connected uh, through application programming interfaces uh, to many systems, government systems, in Indonesia from the National Disaster Management Agency and uh, uh, through our connection to the Indonesia Climatology Agency, we were able to um, deliver directly to people's mobile phones um, an alert about the earthquake in the first few seconds after it happened. And uh, since the earthquake, we've we, there are 124 posts on Atmago about the earthquake. Uh, people are sharing with each other the, um, the services that are available, where to go for 
food, water, shelter, health care um, to, to, to get those services. And now we've um, started to see calls for um, donations and assistance that are coming from that community. Um, and so this has been sort of the cycle of the, um, the way people have been using Atmago in this. Yeah, and as we talked about in our last interview, Atmago is used by nearly 10 million uh, people in Jakarta, or rather in Indonesia. Yes, yes, and we're in three locations. Indonesia is our um, biggest um, user um, group, um, also in Ukraine and in Puerto Rico. And yes, we've had 10 million users since launch and have served over 400 alerts for floods and over 450 alerts for earthquakes. Uh, and it's tremendous the impact that these early warnings that are trusted and that lead to behavior change can have. And I, I mentioned some of those statistics um, from, an, from the independent evaluation, which found that people were taking action as a result of a warning. They were warning their neighbors, they were evacuating, they were moving valuables, and at the scale of a million people, that was $106 million dollars and avoided economic losses and over 6,000 years of healthy life uh, saved. S uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible and it needs to be on a platform that people are familiar with and they're using for their daily lives and that has the entire ecosystem of information they need so they can take action, so they can find water in the hours after disaster. Um, yeah, and so that's the that's the opportunity and the um, fulfillment of that. So what is, uh, you mentioned that, that people have you know, fundraisers that they're posting for support, kind of what does that um, kind of next phase of, it seems like they're already, it's already kind of moving on to the recovery phase uh, after the initial response. And so, you know, how can, how does Atma Go serve people that are in that recovery phase? Yeah, so in the recovery phase, people are sharing these uh, events that people are organizing together to rebuild, to, to clean up uh, um, dam the damage and to, and to rebuild. Um, and what, you know, what I think is really needed and that we've worked on before is um, investing more in large-scale behavior change and awareness building. So we, uh, with Red Cross in two other cities, not in this region, we uh, conducted a, um, an awareness um, building and behavior change campaign to, um, to increase um, uh, development of earthquake resilient infrastructure. So people need to know that there are options and that this is important and this is something that is uh, relevant to the safety of their families. And so we wanna, um, in this recovery and rebuilding phase, is to build resilience and, and to ensure that the next earthquake does not have um, this devastating of an impact. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that's um, needed around that. It's building awareness and demand for those things and having that demand translate into um, uh, collective action to advocate with governments to provide uh, finance for uh, these kinds of um, infrastructure um, that are going to prevent this devastation in the future. Um, yeah, so it's we need to know that the most vulnerable people are on the front lines of disaster and are suffering the most. And so we need to um, make sure that not, not a single life needed to have been lost here. And we can, we can make that so. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again now from Jakarta. Thank you, Tom. This has been a disaster dispatch from Cianjur, Indonesia. Please subscribe to The Response wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube to ensure that you catch future dispatches like this and all of our regularly scheduled bi-weekly episodes. 
You can visit atmaconnect.org to find out more about Mina's work and to access their growing list of tools and resources. This is a project of Shareable.net, an award-winning nonprofit media outlet and action network promoting people-powered solutions for the common good. That's it for today's show. Until next time, take care of each other.